Good afternoon. National Assembly for Wales is now in session. On the first item this afternoon, of questions to the First Minister. And question one is Jenny Rathbone. Dear Clowett, what is the Welsh Government doing to um, su support a sustainable steel industry in Wales? Well, we recognise the importance of the steel industry to the economy of Wales. We've consistently raised with the UK Government the need to ensure that Welsh businesses can operate on a level playing field, not only in the UK, but within the UK and global markets. And that, of course, uh, also includes the, uh, the need to do something to address the energy costs that many steel producers uh, face. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, Celsa Steel has written to me to say that there is a flood of imports uh, coming into this country which do not even meet um, the sustainable steel standards, uh, BS 6001. And this is putting at risk the very important number of jobs uh, in Cardiff, uh, 3,000 jobs in Celsa Steel alone. Um, now, the, the leader of Cardiff Council is writing to all local authorities to make sure that um, all procurement uh, documents specify BES 6001, which is the required standard for safety reasons. Will the Welsh Government um, support the Charter for British Sustainable Steel and look at incorporating that standard for responsible um, sourcing into its own procurement policies? Well, we have made representations to the UK Government about the challenges that the steel industry is facing as a consequence of the growth of steel imports and concerns about responsible sustainable sourcing. We do welcome UK Steel's Charter for British Sustainable uh, Steel. It does provide an opportunity uh, to safeguard uh, much uh, high-value jobs as well as enable growth. But in parallel, we also need to fully consider the impact such a charter would have on both private and public organisations, and we are looking at this in more detail. William Graham. Um, First Minister, I'm sure with me you're welcome Tata Steel's investment in the new £11 million heavy gauge decoiler, the largest in Europe, which will make uh, the demand, or rather extend the demand of, for products, particularly from the Linwern works. Um, what, Minister, are you going to be able to do to help Tata? They've got 100 new products in the last few years, completely diversifying the manufacture of steel in Wales to, to bring these products to the market and to make them competitive in the future. Well, we work very closely with Tata. Of course, I've uh, met with Tata on two occasions, my visits to, uh, to India, uh, and we've seen the investment that has come to Wales as a, a result. Uh, Tata know uh, the challenges uh, that uh, they will face in the market over the next few years, and they are uh, certainly meeting those challenges. We are fortunate that they are a company who believe in investing their way uh, to, towards profit uh, rather than making cuts, and uh, that is something to be uh, acknowledged and, uh, and welcomed. But we'll continue to work with Tata, of course, to make sure that steel production continues to be an important part of the Welsh economy. Rina, uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister perhaps see a comparison here with our demand for strengthening procurement policy in the public sector and that a commitment from the government and that the government was seen to be committing to supporting industry is important and that insisting on having this BS 6001 standard is a means by which the government can demonstrate its commitment to support the steel industry in Wales? Well, in relation to how this would work across the United Kingdom as a whole, there's no legal way to insist that people buy steel from Wales or indeed Britain, but it's possible to ensure that there is a standard that all produce should reach so that it's part of the procurement system here in Wales and the United Kingdom. David Rees. First Minister, in your answer to the member for Cardiff Central, you highlighted the question of high energy costs. And I met with the new hub director of strip products in Wales last week. Uh, and he also indicated the costs of high energy, which were one of the major issues of adding costs to the tonnage that they're selling in the, product, in the marketplace. What discussions have you had with the UK government and perhaps with the EU, particularly in, in light of the EU's uh, energy union consider consideration that they've announced last week? Well, we've consistently raised concerns with the UK government regarding the challenges that are impacting on energy intensive industries in Wales. Most recently, uh, last month indeed, I wrote to Vince Cable outlining the uh, need to introduce support at the earliest opportunity and also to provide the industry with confidence to continue investing in its long-term future and that all of the avenues of support are fully explored. It, it is essential that action is taken sooner rather than later in order to make sure that our energy-intensive industries are able to compete on a level playing field. Question two, Anne Jones. Um, thank you. Will the First Minister make a statement on progress or two 
implement the neonatal sub-regional. Sorry, I've got my, my computer wasn't working. Sorry, apologise. Will the first minister make a statement on progress to establish a sub-regional neonatal intensive care centre, especially yes. gland fluid? I met with the chair and chief executive of the uh, local health board yesterday. This was an issue we discussed. I expect the board to be in a position to submit the outline business case for the CERNIC development by the autumn. Uh, the Minister for Health and Social Services will shortly be writing to members uh, today, I believe, setting out the good progress already made by the Health Board. Uh, thank you very much for that, First Minister, and I do welcome <coughs> your total commitment to seeing that the neonatal centre uh, does, in fact, uh, as per the independent review, be housed at a spotty gland fluid. At lunchtime, I joined other North Wales members to receive a petition from the people of North Wales to the, uh, to the consultant the removal of the consultant-led maternity services, some 16,000, nearly 16,000 people signing that petition. I want to pay thanks to the Daily Post and to Marsha for doing, for organising that, who, and they're sitting in the gallery to listen. Can I just say, First Minister, that uh, when we met with the board, the board told us that um, there were some delays about the framework that was being used to do this neonatal um, centre at Glencluid. Can you give me your assurances that you will not tolerate any delays that will hinder the progress of mothers and babies in a neonatal centre in Glencluid? Indeed not. I, I can uh, confirm to the member, on top of what I've just said about the CERNIC, that as part of the meeting yesterday, I made it clear that I want to see consultant-led maternity services uh, back at Asperti Glencluid within 12 months, as was originally uh, intended. It's right to say that the department has to be rebuilt. Uh, it cannot be uh, suddenly reopened overnight. Uh, but nevertheless, it's imperative that the board work as quickly as possible to make sure those services are restored in the shortest time possible. Darren Miller. Thank you, um, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, I too want to put on record my uh, thanks to Marsha Davis of Little Miracles and indeed the Daily Post for getting behind the campaign uh, in North Wales. It's very clear that tens of thousands of people are unhappy uh, with the Health Board's decision. The petition today calls on the Welsh Government to intervene in the process to ensure that there's continuity of a doctor-led service uh, in Glancluid Hospital, in that maternity unit. Will you give your response to that petition now? Well, there is a formal process here where the Community Health Council, for example, can uh, write formally to request a, a minister's uh, attention and possible intervention. They've not done that yet. They've sent a letter, but they haven't made that formal request. Uh, and we await to see whether that request will be made. But I think it is worth cautioning to say that it simply isn't possible to reopen the department as things stand at the moment. Um, having looked at the uh, issue very, very closely, uh, or rather to, to, to continue with the service, the members right, to continue with the service in the future. The reason is this, there are no trainees there. Trainees were withdrawn because they were complaining about the quality of the training they were getting there. Middle grade doctors are not applying to go there. That's why there are uh, so many locums in place and agency doctors. Uh, and I don't believe it's gonna be possible for the department to be where we would want it to be without those issues being uh, addressed. And we know, of course, of the difficulties that were addressed in the Royal College report and the, uh, and the Steel report. The department has to be rebuilt in order for it to be sustainable in the future. And we see, of course, what's happened with, uh, in Morecambe Bay. We would want to avoid any suggestion of anything like that happening in the future in Wales. By, and I, that's why the local health board have had to take action now. Alan Fred-Jones. Thank you very much. You made your announcement on the intensive care centre, the CERNIC, in May of last year. Since then, the Veterinary Health Board has been awaiting confirmation from the government on that decision. The letter from the government arrived just a fortnight ago. That's nine months after you had made your announcement. And very interestingly, it arrived just a few days after the announcement that the consultant-led service was to be withdrawn from Glancluid. Why has it taken nine months for the government to confirm that decision? And what is the timetable put in place for Betsy Garrard to establish the centre? Well, the member gives the impression that nothing had happened in the meantime. And as I said, the minister will be writing this afternoon to say what has happened in the meantime to tell people that things have happened and to ensure that the CERNIC is established within the timetable that we set out last year. First Minister, during a meeting with members from North Wales, the Health Board said that it wasn't possible to maintain three units across North Wales. Now, I accept your confirmation on the situation in Glancluid, although I do think that the Community Health Council has made the point that they expect 
the minister to become involved in this situation. But can you give us a guarantee this afternoon, therefore, that there will be three units in North Wales in a year's time rather than allowing the health board to perhaps decide at that point to close a unit either in Wrexham or in Bangor? Well, that's not the intention. May I say that that nothing formal has come from the Community Health Council requesting that the minister should intervene. If that does come, if that letter arrives, then that will be considered. But we haven't had a formal letter. We've had a letter. If they want to do that, then they are very free to do so. But I've said before, when the CERNIC itself is established, there will be changes near the departments. That's going to happen. Everyone is expecting that to happen. So there will be some changes regardless in other departments, remembering, of course, what the CERNIC will be doing in future. But what's important is that we do have a department such as the CERNIC in Glancloyd to ensure, of course, as the member wishes to see, that more babies are born in Wales rather than over the border. Move to questions from the party leaders. And first this afternoon, the leader of the opposition, Andrew R.G. Davis. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister, is the smart way to access North America through Cardiff Airport? Depends how much time you have. I'm sorry that you gave such a short answer because the major advertising campaign at the moment says that the smart way to access North America, as we can see in the adverts this morning, is through Cardiff Airport and Aer Lingus. Uh, you have invested £80 million as a government uh, in that airport. Surely if you're going on a trade mission to one of our most important markets, you should be advertising the connectivity that we do have and do enjoy via the Aer Lingus route to North America. Why on earth didn't you make use of that so that you could promote the airport and support the airport management in developing this route? Well, it would have meant me staying uh, or leaving a day before and staying a day after. That was part of the issue. We always look not just at the Aer Lingus link, but also at the KLM link via Skip Hall to see whether that's feasible. But the reality is the timescale was so uh, squeezed it wasn't possible to do it. For example, when I arrived in Washington on Wednesday afternoon at 3, I was then hosting an event at half past 5 on uh, Capitol Hill. Uh, so the time scale is very, very squeezed. But where it is possible and feasible to do it, of course, Cardiff Airport will be the first choice. I think that answer is really disappointing, First Minister, because it was a trade mission. You were promoting St David's Day. One of the key requirements of businesses, as you and your ministers point out, is connectivity and the ability to get from A to B in as quick a fashion as possible. You're in fact saying that what Cardiff Airport are doing just isn't good enough if you're on business or a tight time scale. Will you commit today to back up the investment, which in fairness you've made in the airport of £80 million, and make sure that, eight, that you make sure as many trips as possible on business that you undertake will go from Cardiff Airport because there is great connectivity via KLM to Schiphol and Schiphol being one of the major gateways in Europe or also the Aer Lingus option which only 10 days ago the airport along with Aer Lingus had a major promotional event here in Cardiff promoting it as a means for business and leisure and yet you undermined that campaign with your visit to North America this last weekend. It, it, it was not possible uh, to, was. to get to North America in the time allowed and back again without spending more time there uh, at taxpayers' expense. That was the reality of it. I will always try and use Cardiff. I will be using Cardiff in a fortnight's time uh, when, uh, when I travel uh, once again. I've, I always use Cardiff where it's possible to, uh, to do that. But given the fact that it was such a tight squeeze in terms of the time scale that I had in North America, it wasn't possible to consider that option at this stage. But it's always the first choice. Uh, and uh, I would encourage more people to, in, to uh, use our airport. He's very generous. He says we invested 80 million in the airport. I think it's quite as much as that, but uh, nevertheless, I'm glad that he acknowledges the fact that the airport has received significant investment, and he acknowledges the fact that the airport has attracted more business, uh, uh, and it is all the more ironic given the fact that his party would happily have seen the airport close. We now move to leader of the Plaid Cymru, <coughs> Leanne Wood. Diolch Llywydd. First Minister, there can be no greater responsibility for public bodies than the protection of children from uh, abuse and sexual exploitation. Now, in Downing Street today, the Prime Minister is holding a summit on combating the sexual exploitation of children. The proposals made will have implications for Wales, as many of the matters are led by the Home Office on behalf of England and Wales. 
Are there representatives from the Welsh Government, Welsh Public Services and more imp most importantly of all, uh, advocates on behalf of Welsh victims and survivors at that summit today? Well, I mean, the Leader of Plaid Cymru makes the assumption that these matters are not devolved. It's not quite as clear as that. Uh, there are some areas where it appears to us that matters are devolved. There's no difference in terms of the objective, of course. When it comes to child protection, we shouldn't automatically, uh, automatically assume that because the Home Office is dealing with it, it is not devolved. That's why we are bringing LCMs, uh, like the one today, in order to uh, ensure that the Assembly's viewpoint is heard. Now, on that basis, we have said, and we will always say, that where something is taken forward on an England and Wales basis, there needs to be Welsh representation. We've done that, of course, uh, quite recently, uh, and it's imperative that the Home Office listens to that. Thank you, First Minister, and I know that you've called on the Home Office to include Welsh voices in this process, including the inquiry into child sexual exploitation, which is a non-devolved matter, although I accept the points you make on other aspects of this being devolved. Now, among the Prime Minister's proposals today is the creation of a criminal offence of willful neglect in England and Wales that could impact on teachers, counsellors uh, and social workers. What assessment have you made of the impact of these proposals on Welsh public services and were you consulted on them? Well, we, we take the view that this is a devolved matter. Uh, the view of the UK government is that it isn't. It, it brings us, I suppose, forward to the St David's Day process and what happens beyond that with the reserve powers model. But that is the view that we've take, taken. That's why we bring forward uh, LCMs in this area uh, so that the UK government is able to, uh, to legislate. Uh, we would expect, once they legislate, of course, or during the course of the, of the, uh, the period of legislation, that is full consultation, not just with Welsh Government, but where appropriate with the National Assembly itself, and, of course, with those bodies in Wales who might be required uh, to fulfil certain duties as a result of that legislation. Thank you. Um, it's disappointing from my perspective that Welsh voices are not being heard adequately in this uh, process. It's a criminal offence that we're talking about and criminal justice is not devolved. And I understand that the inquiry on child sexual exploitation held a listening meeting in Wales recently and another is due uh, this week. As there is little in the way of a direct Welsh voice in the inquiry itself, are you satisfied that if concerns are raised regarding Welsh public bodies, that the Welsh Government will be properly informed and that you'll be in a position to intervene if you need to? And are you of the view that the process does enough to protect uh, past victims and survivors of abuse in Wales today? Yes, I, I think uh, it's certainly the case that, well, two things. First of all, it's absolutely imperative that where legislation is taken forward on an England and Wales basis, that Wales is fully involved. Uh, secondly, do I believe that uh, as much protection is in place uh, uh, as can be? Well, there's always a scope for more, and this is why, of course, this is proposed that this offence should be taken forward. I, I would uh, say one thing, however. Criminal justice is not devolved, but criminal law uh, is potentially devolved. Uh, if it's the case that we can't create criminal offences, then Amendment 66 today is out of competence. And I don't believe that uh, necessarily. I'm sure she doesn't believe that either, otherwise we wouldn't be voting on it. Uh, I have always taken the view, uh, and indeed the Supreme Court in the uh, ruling on the Agricultural Sector Wages Bill took the view, that where we can show that something is partially within competence, then we have the ability to legislate. I would argue that, for example, when it comes to uh, child protection, it is within a devolved field. And it is open to us to create criminal offences in that devolved field should we see fit. And I, it's important to make that distinction between the criminal law on the one hand, where the present settlement is silent, and criminal justice on the other, where the settlement says clearly it's not devolved. But there's nothing to stop uh, the Assembly, to my mind, passing criminal law, creating criminal offences, in areas where we can show that that area is at least partially devolved. We now move to Welsh Liberal Democrats, and this afternoon the questions will be asked by Ayd Roberts. John Llywydd. Uh, Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, in 2012, clinicians within the Betsica Rotter Health Board raised concerns about the ophthalmology service. They referred to a number of cases that had led to unnecessary harm to patients. When did the Welsh Government become aware of the nature of those concerns? Well, first of all, we expect all patients to be seen in relation to their own clinical priorities. We know that the Health Board had 
tried to manage some of the problems that have arisen over the past two years and that there is an action plan in place to deal with this issue. There is a pilot, I understand it, within the board itself to improve matters and and if the pilot is successful perhaps there'll be an opportunity to improve things in relation to the other problems over the past two years. The University Health Board from an Ombudsman's report going back to May last year is putting the sight of thousands of patients at risk before, because of a failure to ensure that people are seen in a timely manner. I accept that there's a pilot scheme but the pilot scheme covers 300 patients and figures suggest that there are currently 7,000 patients waiting more than 50% beyond the clinically safe waiting time in ophthalmology. There are 33,000 patients waiting more than 50% beyond the waiting times in services overall. What is your government doing to ensure that across Wales people have access to timely follow-up appointments to ensure that their site is protected, certainly in ophthalmology? Well, th there is a, a, uh, an action plan in place to reduce the number of patients waiting over their target time. We would expect, of course, patients to be seen in order of clinical priority and indeed within the waiting time uh, targets. Uh, more generally across Wales, ophthalmology is one of the first priorities of the NHS Wales National Planned Care Board. And we did bring together uh, in January uh, all the ophthalmologists in Wales to share best practice and to launch a specific clinically led improvement plan for ophthalmology. When the RNIB reported last year um, that this was a growing problem, um, government ministers dismissed the report because of methodology problems. But I think the disclosures today as far as Betsy Cadwallader are concerned makes it ve very clear that the RNIB was spot on. Let us be clear, the reports today in North Wales confirm that in some cases people have gone blind unnecessarily, the cancers have remained untreated, not because they cannot be treated, but because the NHS in Wales currently presides over a system that makes them wait too long. When it, will you be able as a government to give us cast iron guarantees that no Welsh patients will actually go blind merely because of waiting times? Well, that would be unacceptable. There's no, there's no reason trying to d defend the situation if that is the case. Uh, I can say that the Chief Medical Officer did visit with the RNIB recently uh, to meet patients and to listen to their uh, concerns. Uh, and we do expect, of course, that the ophthalmic plan, care plan, uh, should deliver sustainable ophthalmic services in the future that people would expect. We now move back to questions on the paper, and question three is David Rees. Will the First Minister make a statement on plans for economic growth in the South Wales West region for the remainder of this MD term? Yes, our plans for economic growth and sustainable jobs are set out in the programme for government. Well, thank you for that answer, First Minister. And as you are aware, transportation is a critical element of economic growth. And from what I understand, one of the reasons to actually do the trial part time closure, Junction 41, was to the pinch point on the flow of traffic going westwards of that. But that has a consequence of congestion heavily on the roads. Local residents have actually had difficulty in getting to work. Some actually have been threatened with dismissal as a consequence of delays they've been experienced by, by unsympathetic employers. And uh, the economic retail aspect of the Patalba town has taken a hit. Uh, now, I accept that you've indicated that the trial will continue until the end of March and the data will be collected after that point. But after that point, will you look at the opportunity to actually suspend the trial to actually give the opportunity to see if the economic growth of the town can actually get back to a situation where it was before? Yes, I can say to the member, the current trial period, as he says, runs until the end of this month. The decision will be taken before the end of the trial on whether to continue the temporary closures based on the evidence to date. A decision will then be taken in May following analysis of the full trial data, including discussion, obviously, with Neath Patalbert Council as well, as to whether to proceed with public consultation, and is whether, whether to proceed with public consultation for a, pull, a full permanent closure Order. So the next stage is to take the decision on whether the closure should remain or not uh, while the evidence is being assessed. Byron Davis. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I'm sure that you agree with me uh, that the quicker we establish clear governance and budgetary arrangements for the city regions, the faster we can support economic growth, just as we are seeing across the UK and other city regions. With that in mind, can you outline a timescale when we will see the governance and budgetary arrangements for the city regions and a clear line on their objectives? Well, I'd argue that's happening now. Sir Terry Matthews, of course, in the Swansea city region is uh, being very dynamic and constructive in developing a vision that's 
bold and deliverable for the benefit of the city and indeed for Wales as a whole. And I do very much welcome the progress made by the uh, board and the vision that they have set out for Swansea. Bethan Jenkins. First Minister, clearly there's a great deal of anger in Port Talbot on the closure of, closure of Junction 41. And I wonder if you could tell us what is happening with marketing brownfield sites around the area where the peripheral distributor road is now Harbour Way, because I do think that many people believe that that isn't leading to a great deal of development. I think local people could better understand what was happening through your government in the context of Junction 41 if they knew exactly what's in the pipeline with the development of businesses across along that road. Well, the road itself has been of great benefit to the town. It's a bypass to the south of the town and it's opened up a lot of land. We're seeing development so at the moment and working with some of the landowners such as ABP and so on to see development increasing in the end. Question four, Josh and Davis. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, <coughs> how is the Welsh Government meeting its international human rights obligations? Well, we're fully committed to meeting those obligations and we work closely with bodies such as the Equality and Human Rights Commission <coughs> and account for our progress through formal reporting channels. Oh, well, I, I'm very pleased to hear that uh, you were committed uh, to meeting those obligations because, as you'll know, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has been unequivocal uh, in saying that physical punishment of children must be prohibited for countries to meet those human rights obligations. So, First Minister, when will Wales stop being in breach? Well, I mean, I don't accept that Wales is in breach, but the point she tries to make, of course, is in relation to the vote later on this afternoon. She and I are not necessarily in different positions over the principle here, uh, but in different positions in terms of the potential implementation. I think it's important, uh, first of all, for parties to declare in their manifestos what they plan to do with regard to the defence of reasonable chastisement, chastisement. And secondly, of course, to have a full consultation with the public on this as to how that would work. I think that is the, a more sensible way forward. It can be done in a short space of time. There's no question about that. Uh, to take forward the, uh, a, a principle which I know many members uh, are keen to move forward with. Gwenta Thomas. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, will you agree with me that the inclusive policy-making model developed by the Welsh Government requires that all policy and legislation is developed so that it meets the identified needs of individuals and communities, placing a citizen focus based on the principles of human rights, fairness, respect, equality and dignity at the centre of all our policy actions and will you also agree with me that the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act 2014 has an approach to social services that has at its core all of these factors? Indeed I would agree with the member on both counts and I'm grateful to her for the work of course that she put in in taking the bill through uh, when it became an act and inclusive policy making is fundamental to successful uh, policy making. It's at the heart of the Act, as the member has said, and it's underpinned the development of the regulations that build upon the framework of the Act, and that is what we will continue to do as uh, th that process develops. Mohammed Ashkar. Thank you, Madam Presiding Officer. First Minister, in November last year, the Wales UNCRC Monitoring Group published a briefing to mark the 25th anniversary of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. They expressed concern that there was insuffic insufficient focus on children's human rights in the governmental policy and legislation and a lack of transparency and accountability in public expenditure for children and young people. What action will the Welsh Government take to ensure Wales meets its international human rights obligations with regards to the children? Well, we've done that through uh, the measure. But of course, let's remember that we were the first nation to have a children's commissioner. Uh, and that is uh, evidence of the commitment given not just by those who were in government at the time, but all uh, parties in this chamber to uh, the importance of uh, developing the right kind of opportunities and protection for children. I think that is something that we can take great, uh, great pleasure from. Uh, that's not enough of itself, of course, in, in, in the future. We build on the measure and, of course, we, we look uh, to ensure that uh, what is now being planned uh, at Westminster in terms of, of the criminal law uh, is something that uh, would fit appropriately uh, with uh, what has been done here in terms of the establishment of the Children's Commissioner and the, uh, the measure in the past. Question five, Simon Thomas. Uh, 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. What steps will the First Minister take to implement the recommendations of Professor Graham Donaldson's report? Well, Professor Donaldson has set out an exciting vision for the future of learning in Wales. Of course, he has worked with those who work in the profession, parents and others, to seek their views. And the details will be announced tomorrow and further details on the plans for implementation will follow in the summer. Thank you, First Minister, and I agree with you that this is an exciting report. It's extremely thorough and has been given a general welcome from the profession, from parents, and everyone who is interested in education in Wales. One of the things that has happened, however, in the meantime, is that many people have been pressing for the addition of more elements to the curriculum and fear that some things may have been missed perhaps in Professor Donaldson's report but for me the benefit the advantage of the report and its recommendations is that it leaves scope for some flexibility and innovation and leadership from teachers and professionals in the area and that it's very positive to see something like that established in Wales without the heavy hand of any government weighing down on the process so will you remain firmly to those principles principles to trust in the profession with the support and training necessary to lead uh, young people through these exciting new steps so that they can be world leaders in education too. Of course there's a balance to strike here. It's important that there is a framework that teachers in what teachers can teach and what subjects are available and it's there's time for teachers to use their professional skills to teach. We understand that. One of the problems, of course, is that there are comments about what should be in the curriculum. There's no room in the curriculum for everything. So part of the consultation that will take place over the summer will consider what should be in the curriculum and what perhaps can't be included in the curriculum at present. But this is a very exciting time. I have to say it's something entirely new for Wales. There is an opportunity here for us to ensure that we have a curriculum in future that is very robust for our young people. Griffiths? Yes, First Minister, in terms of that balance that you mentioned and frameworks, I wonder if you would agree with me that we must encourage our young people to develop their physical abilities uh, and a love of physical activity and sport for confidence, achievement, quality of life and good health. And would you further agree that that can be effectively achieved through a physical literacy framework that would put physical activity at the core of our curriculum? Well, we know the importance of physical activity. He and I uh, share a love of sport. He has been more successful of late than myself, as my shape will show, uh, in terms of being able to carry that through. But yes, it is important that we develop the whole character of an individual. That much is, is true. Uh, the question then is, how do we fit in uh, physical activity to the, uh, uh, the curriculum and try and get that balance uh, right? Thank you, Presiding Officer. In his statement of last week, the Education Minister said that he would hold a conversation with the public on the Donaldson recommendations, which would include a series of events across Wales where he would seek the views of the education profession, businesses, parents, children and young people. Can you tell us what kind of events the Minister is considering here? And following on from Simon Thomas's question, can you also give us an assurance that these events will be meaningful and will take everyone's views into account? Well, as I said earlier, the details about the activities that will take place will be revealed tomorrow and members can then see what the plans are for the future. William Powell. <coughs> Jock Lowith. First Minister, as a parent, school governor and indeed qualified teacher, I was pleased to see uh, that um, my former union, ATL, welcomed uh, strongly the recommendations on the breadth and depth of Professor Donaldson's uh, report. Uh, I concur uh, particularly with the renewed emphasis that there is upon the uh, individual focused learning experience that must be heart, at the very heart of uh, teaching in our, in our schools. Uh, one concern, however, that has been expressed in some quarters is how that greater uh, breadth of the curriculum uh, is to be delivered uh, in some parts of rural Wales where the size of schools make it more challenging to have that full breadth of the curriculum. What reassurance can you offer uh, that the needs of uh, a broad curriculum will also be delivered for pupils across rural Wales? These are matters, of course, which we consider. It's important that uh, 
uh, peoples in rural areas are not substantially disadvantaged by the fact they live in rural areas. Uh, it's not always possible to replicate um, the education system exactly across Wales. There are good reasons perhaps why that shouldn't be uh, there anyway in terms of replication, but the opportunities should be there. As part of the consultation process that will be announced tomorrow, we hope, of course, that these matters will be raised and then, of course, they can be worked through towards a solution. Question six, Elena Parrott. Thank you. Will the First Minister make a statement on the Welsh Government's priorities for improving transport in South Wales Central? Yes, they're in the draft National Transport Plan. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Overcrowding, as you all well know, on the Valleys Lines is a huge issue for my constituents. And, of course, the design of the current franchise is not at all helpful in that. Um, but before we order any new trains, we must produce a specification for the services and the capacity that we want to deliver in the long term. Indeed, we can't design a new franchise or even begin to think about ordering any new trains until that work is done. Um, the franchise ends in three years. When will that specification be completed and published? Well, that is something that we're moving forward with. I mean, bear in mind that it's only relatively recently that there was agreement to devolve uh, rail franchising fu functions to the Welsh Government uh, from 2017. That will now enable us to control, specify and award future Wales and Borders franchises. And these are matters that we're now considering now that we know where we stand in terms of the devolution of the franchise. Mick Antony. Uh, First Minister, one of the objectives of obviously uh, <coughs> the transport plan is, is to increase connectivity between some of the connective black spots that we actually have, for example, in my constituency around the, the Bather area, Lantwit Vardra, Tonner Evel, uh, Church Village area, which are effectively rail connectivity black spots. Um, and do you agree with me that one of the objectives to come out of the, uh, the metro and the transport planning should be to improve that connectivity, to give people an opportunity, possibly with railway uh, developments and so on, uh, in order to ensure that people have the option uh, when travelling to Cardiff or travelling to work opportunities around South Wales to get off the road, to get on the rail or other forms of transport? Yes, I know the member is particularly um, uh, keen to see the reopening of the line uh, from Ponteclean and Beirai to, uh, to Cardiff. Uh, of course, uh, what the National Transport Plan commits to doing is to developing and assessing schemes identified in the Metro Impact uh, Study. And part of that work will consider the needs of people living to the northwest of Cardiff and the need to make sure that the needs they have will be met in the future. Andrew Archie Davis. Thank you, um, Presiding Officer. Uh, First Minister, obviously anyone travelling into Cardiff, especially in the mornings on Lantrescent Road, for example, or coming from the east, from St Melons and along the A48, or indeed from the Vale of the Morgan, uh, is faced with a pretty horrendous experience. Uh, we're all looking forward to the delivery of the metro system, uh, but that is some considerable time away. Uh, what uh, encouragement or what words of comfort uh, can you give to many of the motorists who find themselves in the daily grind that the Welsh Government is working with local authorities to develop alternatives um, and sustainable alternatives that will take traffic off the roads and provide a realistic transport model for South Wales? Well, I mean, look at what we've done in the past, the reopening of the Ebu Valley line, the opening of the Vale of the Morgan line, of course, uh, that had been long closed until it was reopened. Uh, one of the areas we need to look at now is to look at increasing frequency on the Vale of the Morgan line, potentially as well on the Llenby Valley uh, line, uh, when considering, of course, the, uh, the metro system as a whole. But we've seen, of course, a significant increase in the numbers of people using public transport, particularly the trains over the past uh, 10 years. Uh, that is uh, a trend that I expect to continue in the future, and the metro will be uh, exceptionally important in terms of delivering a more frequent service and possibly new services to many people in the future. Leanne Wood. First Minister, due to a, a combination of funding cuts from both the Welsh Government and local authorities, there are many bus services that have been cut throughout the country, and some of these uh, have been in my region in South Wales Central. And I'm concerned that a situation could develop whereby people are unable to travel to work or to important hospital uh, appointments uh, unless they have a car. <laughs> Is the Welsh Government keeping a record of the bus services that have been lost? And if so, what plans or mechanisms do you have to restore them if demand uh, is there for that? Devolution of bus regulation would be a start, which we don't have at the moment. That is something that, that is uh, uh, at least agreed to be devolved uh, under the uh, current uh, system. One of the problems that I face as a constituency member, I'm sure she has as well, is that where there are complaints about bus services, the bus regulator, if I, if I remember rightly, is in Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, the experience I've had is, has been a poor one uh, in terms of taking up complaints. I look very much forward to seeing the deregulation of, uh, of bus, uh, the regulation of, uh, the regulation of buses being devolved in order that we can offer a more holistic approach to bus services in the future. 
Question seven, Susie Davis. Um, first, will the First Minister make a statement on the role of playing fields in meeting Welsh Government's objectives in relation to well-being? Yes, having access to playing fields is important. Uh, it ensures, of course, that people have opportunities to participate in recreational uh, facilities, uh, and we are now moving forward uh, to dealing with the implementation of the playing fields regulations. Uh, well, thank you for that answer, First Minister. And I heard your very positive response to John Griffiths' question earlier regarding the physical uh, elements of the uh, school curriculum. Yet, as a result of your local authority cuts, some local authorities are taking a rather panicked approach um, to uh, playing fields and green public spaces. Uh, Swansea Council has already targeted playing fields in Sketty and unsuccessfully in Pontedillais, driven by a dash for cash for other projects rather than pupils' health needs. With Donaldson recommendations fresh in your mind, what advice can you give schools to defend their position against those raids? Uh, thank you. Uh, well, as I said, we're considering now the uh, regulations uh, and how to proceed with them. Uh, ultimately, of course, the sale of school land is a matter for each local authority. Uh, there are safeguards in place in terms of um, how planning permission is granted. But the playing fields measure, of course, uh, which was passed here some years ago, is something that we're considering now in terms of passing regulations. We certainly wouldn't want to get to the position of seeing the same situation in Wales as we've seen in England with mass sell-offs of playing fields. Ellen Jones. <coughs> First Minister, the community of Mice Glass in Cardigan are at present trying to protect their playing field from development and are going through the process of seeking to register the playing field as a village green. Now, the planning bill brought forward by your own government is going to limit the ability of communities to register their playing fields and safeguard those playing fields through that process. Are you willing, therefore, to look at this and dis have discussions with the planning minister to ensure that this right that communities currently have is not diluted by the legislation that you're bringing forward? What is important here is that there's a balance. There is a system that has been in place now that's been a system that's been used many times in the past, perhaps not in the way that people would have thought it would have been used. But having said that, we want to ensure that the le new legislation does ensure that there are open spaces available for communities, remembering, of course, that sometimes in the past this has been used as a way of preventing homes from being built in communities. So that balance is going to be important in future. Peter Black. Thank you, Presiding <coughs> Officer. Minister, Susie Davis has already referred to the situation in Swansea where, in fact, there are proposals to sell off a lot of playing fields, very similar to happened in England under the previous UK government. Um, in England, though, there is, of course, the Localism Act, where, which um, protects um, sports fields, but that has not been brought in in Wales. Is it your government's intention to try to bring that extra protection to playing fields in Wales by, um, by um, commencing the Localism Act here? Oh, well, it's an English Act. I mean, work has begun to amend the draft regulations under the playing fields measure, which is Welsh legislation, prior to a final decision on the introduction of those, over, of those regulations over the course of the next few months. Legislation already exists in Wales uh, to, to deal with this. Uh, it has historically not been a problem in Wales that it was in England. But nevertheless, I hear and I see what, uh, what's being proposed in Swansea. And that's why, of course, we're considering now how best to take these regulations forward. Question 8, Beth and Jenkins. Will the First Minister make a statement about concerns raised regarding Swansea University School of Management? Well, well, these are, of course, entirely a matter for management and governors at Swansea University. They are autonomous bodies and they are responsible for their own affairs. I hear what you say, uh, Minister, but you will know that uh, the internal paper last year described certain economic staff as a cancer, and since then I've been contacted and I've met many students and interested parties that feel intimidated enough to ask that I keep their names confidential for fear that the department or the university will take action against them. One of them said, and I quote, a university is where freedom of speech and the ability to learn and question should be encouraged. First Minister, do you support this view and what can your government do to raise these very real issues with Swansea University whereby students are fearful to go and access education because of intimidation and bullying within that department? Well, I am aware of some of the issues which have been reported in the press in respect to the School of Management at Swansea University. Uh, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment in detail on those issues with regard to an autonomous HE institution. What I will say, of course, is I hope that these managerial issues can be resolved swiftly uh, to the satisfaction of staff and students because 
Uh, if this continues, it will be detrimental to the good reputation of the department and the university. So I would encourage all those involved, including the, the university itself, of course, to resolve this issue as quickly as possible. Susie Davis. First Minister, I agree that it is a shame to see the complaints in the management school being broadcast in the public arena. There's no specific matter for the government, I know, but is there anything in the exchanges that have made the university less attractive, in your opinion, sufficient perhaps to raise concerns about widening access schemes? Well, no, because in terms of the university itself, it appears that there has been a great increase, not only in the last academic year, but also in this academic year. So Swansea University is considered as an excellent university to study at. And what's important is that that should continue and that the problems that have been raised this afternoon do not, not have an impact on the reputation of the university. First Minister, we now move to item two.